welcome to Stellenbosch Business School. Welcome to the audience in the room here in Cape Town. Welcome to our uh, friends, stakeholders, colleagues, students on, online. I can just remind everybody in the room to please put your phones on silent so we don't dis disturb the, uh, the, the running order and the, uh, the pills of wisdom we're going to receive from, from our, 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 our esteemed panel. It's an exciting time for us at the, at the business school. You'll have known, anybody who knows uh, Stellenbosch Business School for some time will know we've changed our name. And that's a, that, that's a, a signal for us to, to move on to another phase in, our, in, our, in existence, in our, in our evolution. As we, as, we, as we grow the school and continue our impact nationally and internationally. It's also an exciting time since we've just been awarded again uh, accreditation from AACSB, the Americans, and AMBA, the UK accreditation authorities. As many of you know, Stellenbosch Business School was the first triple accredited school on the continent and remains one of only four on the continent, and that places us among the top 1% of business schools in the world. And we're very proud of that, and we see that as part of our uh, our signal as, 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 as quality, but also a lever for us to have impact in wider society. But Stellenbosch is much more than a school. It's more, much more than the programs we offer in MBA, PGD, PhD. We see ourselves as part of a local ecosystem. That ecosystem being Stellenbosch, Cape Town, the Western Cape, South Africa, but also that's that the, the networks and partnerships we have around the world. And being part of those, those stakeholder groups, those, eco, those overlapping ecosystems, mean that we should be a convening space to discuss the important issues of the day, to bring together our own expertise from the school, but also expertise from our, our different stakeholders. Whether that's discussing uh, challenging topics like the, the issue of transformation in the university, in organisations in South Africa as a whole, the challenges we face in terms of new technologies and artificial intelligence, and of course the challenges we face in relation to the economic headwinds, and particularly this week, the budget and how the South African state and, and economy will res res respond to those, uh, those, those issues. That allows us to bring together our expertise with, with our stakeholders from, uh, from Nedbank and Old Mutual. We're very proud to have the chief economists of both those organisations with us, but also to valorise and bring together expertise from inside the school. We have Dr. Leanne Steenkamp, who's an expert in carbon tax, but also heads up our financial planning program to bring it together both a, a sort of a, the sustainability dimension and also the professional, professional qualifications. Very, very, very proud to have uh, Christian Franken here, who won the uh, came second, sorry, in the in the, uh, the competition yesterday, run by NetBank and Old Mutual for postgraduates in terms of the response to the to the, uh, to, to the budget. And of course, we have we have our, our facilitator, Andre Roux. Many of you know from the TV or from from from, from classes or from uh, and his very various in, in interventions uh, in in the school in South Africa and, and, and around and around the world. I'm just going to introduce Andre briefly, and then he'll he'll carry on with the rest of the rest of the program. So Andre Roux is a has a PhD in economics and is known as an economist. But also he's known as a pioneer in, in developing future studies and foresight work here at the university. And that's something we're very proud of. I think it's a very useful tool that we equip our students and our stakeholders with, of what, where we think about how we, how we develop as an economy, develop as a society towards desired futures. The, my, the, the futures team here in the business school not only delivers a range of programs in that area, but also a range of, uh, of, of different activities for our stakeholders, which are key in then planning their how they want to see their future work worked out, whether that is government, local government, organisations, international organisations. We're actively involved in that. We have to thank Andre for his pioneering work in the area of future studies. He's also known as an economist, an economist that leads the way in, in commentary and, and analysis here, here in South Africa. His book, Everyone's Guide to South African Economy, is now in its 13th edition. To, just as, as a testament to the, the quality and the relevance and the, uh, the importance of, of, of that guide, I think that's really a, an, asta an astounding feat in, in today's, world, today's world where there's such a rapid turnover of new, new requests for knowledge. I think to be, to be coming around 13 times is, is really a great challenge. But also Andre is a frequent member of panels and interviews on the TV and the radio, all to comment on what's going on in the South African economy, but also other economies Across the, across the continent. I frequently see him popping up in my YouTube channel for, for, for the Nigerian, Nigerian TV or, or, or 
Egyptian TV, or he's, he, he's, uh, he, he's, he's known, known far and wide. So for that, for that, we're very proud and very lucky to have here to facilitate the event this evening, but also to be uh, a, a member of the of Stellenbosch Business School. So I hand over to Andre. Welcome you all to the Stellenbosch Business School and this inspiring event with our, with our partners, uh, Nedbank and Old Mitchell. Andre. Thank you very much, Mark and, Mark, and thanks for hosting this event. We look forward to it. Hello to everybody out there in cyberspace. Hello to everybody here in the room, and a special word of welcome to our panelists, who I shall introduce in the next couple of minutes. Perhaps just to show you what we plan to do this morning, very straightforward. I'll quickly introduce the panelists, and then they will engage, along with me and the audience, in a discussion about, obviously, the budget. We'll spend roughly 30 minutes on that. Towards the end, we'll have one or two questions from the audience, both locally, both here and out there. And then at about 10 past 10, we'll wrap things up. So first of all, allow me to introduce our four panel members. Uh, I'll start, as one should, with Leanne, Dr. Leanne Steenkamp. As you heard a bit earlier from Mark, I'll, give, I'll just give you a rundown of her basic claims to fame. Uh, she's a tax and accounting lecturer at the Business School. She teaches both the MBA and the Postgraduate Diploma in Financial Planning, which, by the way, she heads. She heads that program. She's an extraordinary professor in tax at UNISA. She's also a National Research Foundation rated researcher. Not many can boast that. She has a PhD in public law from the University down the road, uh, Cape Town. Um, <laughs> where she focused on the transition from the old Kyoto Protocol to the new Paris Agreement on Climate Change. She also has a Master's Degree in Taxation, she's a registered tax practitioner, and she focuses uh, the research on certain kinds of green tax issues. Here she supervises many MBA, MPhil Development Finance and Doctoral students, frequently publishes in peer-reviewed journals, contributes towards books and university prescribed textbooks, presents at international conferences, and as I said earlier, she's program director for the PG Different Financial Planning. But that's not enough. Uh, she advises on carbon tax policy matters. She chairs the SA Institute of Chartered Accountants Carbon Tax Subcommittee, which in turn provides input to National Treasury. And she serves on the African Tax Administration Forum. Uh, and then finally, she's a member of the steering committee of the Biennial International Conference on Clean Electrical Power uh, held in Italy. So clearly, Leanne's the right person to have here today to pass comment on various aspects of the tax side of the budget, not least of which hopefully some thoughts on the proposed tax measures for installing solar energy. Leanne, very warm word of welcome. Thank you. On the app's right, we have Johan Els. Um, Johan is Chief Economist at Old Mutual. He holds an MCOM, uh, which he attained at Stellenbosch University. He studied there uh, courtesy of the Reserve Bank. So not surprisingly, after completing his studies, he joined the SA Reserve Bank's Economics Department. He then spent a couple of years as a lecturer at Stellenbosch University, and that's where Johan and I first crossed paths. We were colleagues there. I won't mention the years, except to say it's about 40 years ago. Um, after that, he joined the then Trust Bank, now part of APSA, and joined Old Mutual as an economist in 1991. Perhaps another interesting, unimportant fact is that uh, I left Old Mutual as an economist in 1991. Uh, so we followed each other at least 30 years ago in different ways. Yuan looks at all areas of macroeconomic research, including the global economy, with a special emphasis on USA, Europe, and China, and then domestically, all variables ranging from the RAND exchange rate, inflation, interest rates, fiscal matters. He provides a crucial input in the investment processes within the Old Mutual Investment Group. He serves as an economist for the broad Old Mutual. And when all is said and done, that research is aimed at answering two, two specific questions. What is the impact of the economy on different asset classes? And therefore, what is the impact on the organization's investment decisions? You are very warm word of welcome. Great to see you again after a few decades. <laughs> on my left-hand side, 
Isaac Macheco, and please excuse my pronunciation, as a senior economist uh, at Nedbank Group, the Group Economic Unit. Previously, he was with Standard Bank, with Group's economic the Group Economic Decision, uh, sorry, Group Economic Division, specifically the Africa Desk. He has, he has holds a number of degrees, one from the University of Northwest, one from UNISA, both in economics, uh, a master's in commerce specializing in development finance from, again, down the road, University of Cape Town. And he focuses on African economies, fiscal policy, sovereign risk analysis, capital markets and developing economies, and development finance. Uh, as is the case with Iran, he gives talks regularly throughout the country to various kinds of audiences, business forums, agricultural groups, corporate firms, government entities, and then also commentating regularly in the print and electronic media. And our final guest, a very special guest, is on, the, on my extreme left-hand side, um, Christian Pranken. Now, as Mark suggested, or points out a bit earlier, uh, for 51 years, I believe it is, Old Mutual and Netbank have run a competition, uh, the Netbank Old Mutual Budget Competition. And again, I have a personal involvement here. Uh, in a previous lifetime, I used to accompany the winning student from my entity to the Budget Week for a good 10 years. Uh, and I can assure you it is really worthwhile. Uh, and both the lecture and the student learn a great deal. And in the more recent times, for about 10 years, I was one of the culture adjudicators for this competition. So we, I'm very happy that Christian is here. He is a postgraduate from Stanford University, obviously a finalist in the competition, and as you heard a bit earlier, he came second, which means I think that Christian, you're about 100,000 rand better off now than you were yesterday. Uh, drinks are on you. Uh, The topic that was set for the postgraduate category was to evaluate the impact of public infrastructure investment on economic growth, uh, especially in the post-2000 era in South Africa. So again, you would agree, highly relevant for any budget speech, not least to which this one. So, once again, a warm welcome to all of you. I think just before I hand over to you, if you just indulge me and just allow me to give you just some of the basic outlines of yesterday's budget speech. I simply and literally just extracted a few facts and figures directly from the various budget documents, starting off with, I suppose we could say, the underlying conditions, the global outlook. As we all know, the global outlook is not all that exciting. Globally, including here, economic growth, rather wishy-washy. Then some of the assumptions made uh, by the Treasury in terms of our own economic performance includes, if I'm just finding the right button here, and I'm still going to find it. Uh, can we go back one, sorry? No, that's, that's my fault. Okay. There we are. Includes, that's no, not there. Economic growth, economic growth forecast um, for South Africa. We'll get it right in a minute. No, it's not there. Doesn't matter. Uh, economic growth forecast around about 0.9% for this year. Not all that exhilarating. In terms of the basic numbers, as was well recorded and well reported, as always, expenditures set to exceed revenue. But interestingly, if we were to exclude interest payments, we'd actually have a small budget surplus. As it is, this year, we expect to borrow close to 276 billion rand. And then, because of that, uh, obviously our government debt will be rising, and I'm sure we'll be talking about that uh, uh, over the next few minutes. On the spending side, uh, the effect of that interest is coming through very clear. Uh, it's one of the highest spending items on the right-hand side, second from uh, second the top, debt service costs the second highest spending item over the next three years after learning and culture. On the revenue side, all we note here is, as always, personal income tax payers account for the bulk of tax revenue, followed by VAT, corporate income tax, 
and then customs excise duties, fuel levies and then other bits and bobs. And that's all I want to just say just to give us a context for some of the basic numbers. From here onwards, I hand over to our panelists. Can we uh, unshare or get rid of that, please? I think maybe, let's start with you, Johan. Uh, your general views, but perhaps just also bear in mind, uh, as if you need to be reminded, that uh, if we look at some growth forecast for this year, I think you just come out of being rather towards the top of the range, at a, at a rather higher end of the range of forecasts. Is that still part of your thinking, and, and why a bit higher than the rest? And another question, do you think the Minister's assumptions are in any way valid or accurate? Uh, and that's a good point, and I'll start with the Minister's assumptions. I think they're credible. I am conservative, and that's good to be conservative because I personally think the 0.9% as you indicated is a little bit too low, but that's good in terms of budgeting. Then the chances are that they will get a better outcome rather than a worse outcome. Incidentally, I think the Reserve Bank's 0.3% is just simply too low. I think that was perhaps a warning towards government in terms of getting this electricity situation sorted out, and I think that 0.3% will be revised up in the course of the year. Yeah, I've got 2% and I'm very happy with that forecast. Firstly, the electricity intensity of the economy has reduced significantly over the last 20, 23 years. So we produce the same amount of GDP with 25% less electricity now than in 2000. Plus there's lots of extra private energy coming online. So the electricity impact won't be as severe as the Reserve Bank wanted to indicate, for good reasons from their side. Falling inflation will help consumers, real income growth will get some support. It's nothing exciting, but at least better support than what we thought perhaps. The fixed investment cycle, if we go through the building blocks of GDP, the fixed investment cycle, especially private sector energy investments, that will add nicely. The um, inventory cycle is still ongoing, the depletion of inventories during COVID, they're still not back up to where they were, they're still building up, that adds to production, that adds to GDP, so I'm happy about that. And then you mentioned the global situation. We, we're in a somewhat better position globally than what we were, let's say, four, five, six months ago. Euro area, USA seems to be heading towards a soft landing. There are certainly risks, but it's better than what we thought a while ago. Incidentally, I looked at the latest PMI indicators for this week, and they're all heading up suddenly. So from a downswing, we, we're drifting up back towards expansionary territory. And then, of course, China second biggest in economy in the world, rebounding quite strongly after their reopening. So in South Africa's case, there's some support for net exports as well. So I would rather stick to a 2% growth forecast, but I'm happy that they stuck at 0.9 because that's a conservative budgeting process. And of course, if it were to turn out to be anything about 0.9 as much as 2%, then those ratios would far better. Absolutely. the debt ratio. Uh, any general comments about the budget, your general feeling? I think it was a great budget in the sense they delivered on the ESCOM um, debt situation, so that takes a lot of the risk out of the system. Um, and then in terms of the budget, I wanted them to continue with this policy of fiscal consolidation, which they strongly did. For me, a negative surprise would have been if they deviated from the strong message in October MTBPS last year. They absolutely continued in that way. And there's some concerns about the accounting for the ESCOM stuff. But overall, it's, it's in line. It's what, uh, according to the concepts that they've been using for their own debt. So that's okay. That's strong fiscal consolidation. And as you mentioned, primary surplus. That means that suddenly, first time in 15 years, we're not borrowing money to pay our interest. And, and that's fantastic. That's the real measure of fiscal consolidation. So last point is, back in October 2020, the debt to GDP ratio was supposed to be heading towards 95% of GDP before it was peaked then it being lower. Now it's just above 70% of GDP. A um, couple of reasons we, we can go into that, even with the addition of the ESCOM debt. So that's substantially better and it's heading lower. So conservative budgeting, I think it was a credible budget, ticked all the boxes. Thank you. Isaac, um, given what you understand, as we all see, would you say that this was an austerity budget? <coughs> Thank you, Professor. Uh, not at all. You know, this morning, just watching TV, uh, some social activists and you know 
arguing that this is an austerity budget? Not at all. One of the slides you showed uh, indicates that Lenin and culture now will be the biggest expenditure item until a couple of years ago. That service costs were at number one. Now, a lot of money being allocated to learning and culture. And actually, in the uh, mini budget in October, you'll recall that the minister indicated that uh, the government is going to employ more uh, police officers and uh, health professionals and all that, and teachers. So, it cannot be an austerity uh, budget. And going into next year, we know that. Uh, the basic income grant is coming, and uh, so we cannot be talking about the austerity budget when social expenditure is being expanded. And actually, social spending is rising at a faster rate than the increase in government revenue. You just made an interesting point about uh, the basic income grant is on the cards. We, we know that. The, I remember in the mini budget, uh, the, well, with the uh, SRD, uh, Social Revenue for Distress, uh, the 350 rand per month payment, you know, it was supposed to be uh, for one year during COVID, then it was extended for another year. In October last year, they managed to uh, sort of extend it to March 2024. And I'll put my head on the block and say, we know elections are coming in May 2024. And uh, there's no way that uh, the current government, the incumbent government, uh, will just before an election cut social spending. Talking about elections on the way, let's talk about the sticky uh, civil servant wage bill. Uh, I think the minister is kind of assuming a, a, a wage increase of just over 3%, where civil servants are asking for 10% plus. Is that going to be a, a, a vote of contention, you want? Yes, on the one hand, that's where you can't do, there's one hand and another hand. But, um, of course, but then Treasury has been very tight on the budget for the wage bill over the last few years. If we would have extrapolated 2019's medium term budgets for the wage bill compared to where the wage bill sits now, that's a saving 150 billion rand. So they had a wage freeze, they had a very low increase. So unions aren't as strong as they used to be. So Treasury is playing on that fact. So if the wage increase should be higher than what they've got in the budget, the minister was adamant, he said it last year at the budget dinner and last time he said it again. If there's some higher wage increase, they will have to cut costs elsewhere or they will have to cut their income. So they're very strong on that fact. Plus there's a big unallocated reserve sitting in the budget. So there's some room for maneuver without burning too much of that slowing deficit. And on your view on the basic income grant? The minister personally is adamant we can't afford it as it stands, at the basic income grant itself. But I agree that the COVID grant or some form thereof will likely continue. They've also been tight on that as well, having a means test, and they've been saving money uh, implementing that means test. So adamant last night as well, and the minister is very willing to say this on a public stage, that if we cannot afford it, we cannot afford it. If we're going to get a basic income grant, you will have to tax us significantly more. And Treasury has shown that they don't want to tax us more. We overtax. They realize that fact. So just as an aside, uh, people used to say Treasury is decimated, good people have left. I think Treasury is as strong as ever, and good people. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, think, I think the question of the social grants or the so-called social grants, I think you're right, both of you, that you know, once you start granting these kind of things, it's almost like an addiction, but you can't take it away. Mm -hmm. And it would be politically imprudent to do so. Whether we can afford, uh, as you say, a basic income grant, well, that's a, that's a new question. But you already mentioned the word tax on one or two occasions, so Leah, before we feel neglected, let's talk about the tax side. Uh, overall, the seat being a net tax relief of around about 9, 10, 11 billion rand. Uh, when you say that quickly, that sounds good. But if we break it down, I suppose one of the most interesting developments has been the announcements made regarding 
install installation of alternative sources of energy. Uh, one arrangement for companies, another one for individuals. Do you think it's going to work? Do you think it's going to achieve the desired objectives? Um, I don't think we should look at gift horse in the mouth, so I'm not, never going to say no thank you for tax relief. Whether it will be enough to move the needle, um, of course, remains to be seen. So I agree with uh, the other panelists that it wasn't an, a budget of austerity. In fact, the Minister of Finance said it's a budget of give and take. And he's given a bit to private individuals or households, and he's given somewhat more to businesses. So the uh, the renewable energy tax incentive, which we already have, has been expanded. That's great. For households, um, there is a tax rebate uh, that you can claim. It's only for one year. That's why we personally have held back on installing the solar panels. But I don't think it's going to be enough to make someone decide to purchase solar panels. So I would have liked to see um, a bit more of an expanded uh, tax incentive for renewable energy for households. Um, just practically, if you purchase solar panels, it's not really that helpful without the inverters and the batteries, and there's no tax incentive for that. But we do have to also consider that there's a larger climate policy here as well. So government is trying to balance fiscal policy with climate policy, and I think this is the, the best give and take that they, that they could come up with. I would also have liked to see a bit more detail on um, the two-part retirement system that is set to come into effect on the 1st of March next year. It's going to bring about huge uh, changes uh, for financial institutions um, and we expected uh, more information yesterday but none was forthcoming. Can we just go back to that, the two-part retirement system? What does it mean in practical terms for the institution and for the retiree? So essentially the two parts mean means that you can extract your retirement fund I think up to 30% before retiring. 70% remains in the second pot uh, for you to use while you are retired. And that is essentially a way to force uh, taxpayers to save to, towards their retirement. I think from an administrative point of view for the financial institutions, they would have to rethink their systems, the way that the money is claimed. Um, by the uh, by, the individuals. Um, so, 12 months from now, it's it's not a long time, I think, for, for making these changes. Looking at personal income tax, no increases. In fact, if anything, suggestions of some relief or fiscal drag. Does that surprise you? No, I think it's the usual um, adjustments that we see, uh, so that you don't get what's called bracket creep or inflation creep. Um, a boring budget is a good budget, I think, Absolutely. from a tax point of view. We don't want any surprises. So I think in that sense, it's, as, as Johan said, it was a careful and conservative budget. Um, so at least we didn't see any tax increases. And it's good that Treasury acknowledges that we are overtaxed. You showed in your one slide that personal income tax makes up the bulk of tax collections. And we've also seen that there are more and more individuals immigrating, maybe not physically immigrating, but financially immigrating. And I think it's, uh, government recognizes that you can't kill the goose that lays the golden egg. Um, so in yeah. that sense, it was a, a good budget, I think. Yeah, the corporate tax left unchanged, although I do think there's a kind of a longer term intention to reduce it down to 25%. I think so, yeah. So it used to be 28% for quite a number of years, uh, last year to 27% uh, reduction, and maybe in future they will, they will continue to decrease. But again, it's a give and take, so there isn't a lot of leeway. Um, there was some speculation that the VAT rate might be increased, but it's, it stayed at 15%. Um, so no, we'll have to see the, in, the, in the next medium term budget speech how that will play. Mm, yes, our VAT rate is lower than the national, international average. Do you think it's ever going to be on the cards, Isaac, an increase in the VAT rate? Well, going back to uh, budget. 2022. Uh, in the budget review, uh, I got the feeling that uh, the National Treasury is leaning towards lowering taxes. First reason being to reverse uh, the tax increases that we enjoyed since 2016. You'll recall that uh, marginal tax rates uh, for individuals were increased by a percentage point. 
We have that introduction of that uh, super tax rate of 45%, uh, and then uh, the increase in the Fed rate. And uh, on the corporate tax rate, they had a section comparing South Africa to the other OECD countries. And they said, you know, the average corporate tax rate in organization, the economic uh, cooperation in development countries is 23%. Another time we're sitting five percentage points above that. So I've got a feeling that, uh, you know, we can expect tax cuts in, in, the, in, the, in the coming years. And even the measures uh, introduced uh, this year, you know, the proposals for individuals, I mean, uh, I think probably the first time in history that uh, four levies have been have not been high for two years in, in a row. Uh, compensation for bracket, uh, bracket crib. In the past uh, years, we saw the adjustments being below the inflation rate. At least this year now, they match the inflation rate. So I maintain uh, the sentiment that uh, National Treasury is leaning towards uh, the tax that rate you want? I think by all accounts, just as our corporate tax rate is probably above average, above the bill, but average our flat rate is probably slightly below it. Yes, it is. Um, and absolutely, the indication is that Treasury wants to live that. So I'm going to have it next year. But they are after that. Um, I think most people in the markets were surprised when they lifted it from 14 to 15 percent, saying the ANC as a government will never do it. But they've been very prudent in the fiscal situation, and they realised then they had to raise it. They realised now they have to raise it. It's definitely, I think, um, we can expect a back rate increase over the, within the next five years. Christian, we haven't forgotten about this. <laughs> um, obviously, a big part of the budget as always amounts allocated or budgeted for, let's call it infrastructure spending, or investment spending. Um, why, why is this so important for the country? Well, so in the SRI I wrote a, bit of, a lot of research on what, what is the impact of infrastructure investment by the government on the economy. And all across the world mostly what you see is there is a positive relationship between infrastructure investment and economic growth. Because infrastructure can function as a complement to other factors of production in the economy. It can make total factor productivity more higher, more efficient. And whether it's roads and sewers and irrigation, or whether it's schools and hospitals, both economic and social infrastructure can uh, have a big role in making it possible for people to trade, to connect, and that undoubtedly has an impact on our economic growth. Uh, and I do see, I think it was 908 billion that the government wants to spend on uh, uh, infrastructure as a whole, both social and economic. So that's a, was a welcome um, statement by the finance minister. I think that's over the next three years, yes. Yes. Uh, but they often make these kinds, they often budget for even more than the past trillion plus. So what happens to it? Does it ever get spent? That's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose maybe there's a risk that you could spend on the wrong things. Uh, there's this tendency in the academic literature for something like a white elephant. It's when certain gov governments spend money on some <coughs> infrastructure that look very impressive, but they don't really work that well, or they're not, not very functional. So it's possible that some of the money could, by mistake, be spent on something like that. Um, so. Yeah, so I think you can't just throw money at the problem, it's about how well you spend it. So if there is mismanagement of, of, of the money, then perhaps the, the infrastructure investment may not amount to what we think it, it would. Yeah, I suspect it's not always mismanagement, just simply the inability to spend it if you want. Yeah, the capacity, especially at local government level. So the one of those monies, I think, I squished the table briefly, is it uh, state-owned enterprises, Transnet and ESCOM, so lots of money being spent there, but we need more on the local level. Whenever I speak to audiences and I try to spin my slightly more positive story, people say, yeah, but there's a pothole in front of my street, and he, these kind of issues... More than 25 million. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I always say economics is the study of human behavior, if you will. Uh, and so it's in the bottle, it's the load shedding that impacts on our behavior. And, and that's hugely important in terms of confidence, the 
willingness to spend. But you talked about capacity, absolutely local government. But there's a lot of emphasis from Treasury side to work on local government's ability to spend. Um, so these things are ongoing. It's not, there's no solutions that will work overnight, unfortunately. Well, talking about infrastructure and load shedding, let's spend a few minutes talking about the announcements made regarding ESCOM's debt. Uh, government agreeing to take over, as it were, more than half of the outstanding debt. Not a big surprise, I think it was on the cards. Uh, but do you think they're doing the right way? I think it's creative, um, without being too bad for government's accounts. So, uh, just briefly, government had 66 billion sitting in the expenditure accounts budgets for the next three years, so they're taking that away. Um, so it reduces the deficit, so in that creative accounting they're now handling it somewhat differently. Um, so it adds to the debt, it's below the line. Um, that's not too bad, uh, it's a slight negative, not a huge negative. So we improve the deficit and we take away a huge chunk of the risk that will come home to roost if ESCOM should fail. Um, but having said that, the ratings agencies have in any case always um, added ESCOM's guaranteed debt to government's debt in the way they look at these things. So if the debt ratio lifts a little bit, um, that's not too bad. Um, I think overall in the way that they're doing it for the first two years, um, all the capital pay repayments of debt that comes due, interest payments, and then only in year three that they take over some debt. So I think it's a, it's a overall a good package. Um, over the last few weeks, markets have been thinking there won't be anything on this debt. So the fact that there was no negative surprises and a huge jump phased in with some conditions, I think that was good. Uh, is it too much, too little, too late? No, not at all. Uh, just to add first to uh, what your aunt says, uh, you know, the way it was presented, the way it's structured, uh, we always uh, believed that there was no other way uh, to do it. Because there was an expectation in the market that uh, the government was going to take over the unguaranteed debt. Uh, out of ESCOM's 420 billion, about uh, 350 billion is guaranteed by the government, and the rest is uh, not guaranteed. And that's the expensive debt that uh, ESCOM pays. And the, we, there was certain that the government was going to target that debt. Uh, but the difficulty there uh, with the ratings is that uh, ESCOM rating is about two or three notches below the uh, government, the country rating uh, in the triple C's. And that simply means that ESCOM pays much higher interest rates uh, than the national treasury. So there was going to be some uh, very difficult uh, technicalities go to go through if government was just going to take over uh, that debt. So, what we got yesterday is, you can call it another bailout. It is our government paying debt on behalf of ESCOM as that debt matures. And uh, we saw it as the only way uh, to, to do it. it. It shouldn't be the end. Uh, ESCOM has to be sorted out. It has to be financially viable. I mean, uh, in recent years, ESCOM can cover only 85% of its financial obligations from its cash flow. So technically, it is bankrupt. It should go under. So the focus should be on strengthening the management of ESCOM. But we know uh, the troubles at the power stations and all the other uh, allegations being made. I, I agree with you. And the issue of good governance, I think, is really a, is the most pertinent issue when it comes to ESCOM and other state-owned entities, the notion of responsible leadership, and in that sense there's frustration among taxpayers that we've heard the words tax revolt, you know, in the past. The government isn't honouring their side of the social contract with taxpayers, that we as individuals, we have to pay for our own security because government isn't protecting its citizens. We have to pay for electricity, we have to buy generators, which is not tax deductible, it's still not tax deductible. Um, so the good governance issue is really, really important. Um, and on that note, SARS as an institution, I think has really stepped up and, and tuned up the act in, in recent years. And you've also pointed out that there are 
they are really good individuals in Treasury and elsewhere, and we need to support them and, and, and strengthen those. And it's partly because of that reason that SARS has improved their tax condition, uh, which is why the Minister is now able to reallocate more revenue to something like the solar panel at tax rate. Yeah, I, I, I agree a lot about it. I think we're very fortunate that, as you mentioned, Treasury, SARS, and the Reserve Bank. I think that they are doing a sterling job sometimes in difficult circumstances. It's going back to the, the debt relief for ESCOM, it does come with some very interesting strings attached uh, from, from the government side. Yes, it does. I worry, though, that those strings on or those conditions on well, aren't going to be met before the money flows. So there are strings, absolutely, like they have to be subjected to an international team that will investigate these power stations, recommendations that they will have to implement, they can't borrow new money, a whole range of those. But some of the money will flow before they comply to those conditions. Uh, and that's a bit of a concern. So if Treasury pass over the money, if they haven't fulfilled the conditions, however, you're not going to get the money back. So there's a little bit of a question mark around those conditions. Nevertheless, I think um, we have to accept the overall package. It's the less of the evils, uh, it's, it's probably you. Uh, see, let's, let's go to the question of sovereign debt ratings and credit rating agencies. Do you think this budget will, what, what, will, it, will it change the ratings? And the second question, does it matter? Well, I'll, I'll say the budget reduces uh, the likelihood of further downgrades. Uh, it's, a, in my opinion, a rating neutral budget. Uh, you know, we must be honest, uh, National Treasury's budgeting is always pragmatic. It's about the implementation of policies and the management of SOEs and that responsibility falls to other departments. The biggest risk right now to the rating is the growth rate. Uh, yesterday, uh, National Treasury released sort of three scenarios. Best case scenario is what they, we showed there, 0.9% growth this year. So we get the best case. Yeah, best case GDP growth of 0.9 and 1.5 uh, next year. I mean, that's net bank, we're very close to that. We expect 0.7. Uh, this year, Johan is the fly in the ointment here, <laughs> I would say. Very optimistic. But yeah, middle of the road. Oh, let me just start, uh, go back to the best case. And National Treasury assumes that the investment in renewables is going to be significant. Uh, the incentives uh, presented in the budget yesterday are going to really stimulate uh, investment spending both by households and the corporate sector and the renewables, and that will give a boost uh, to the domestic growth. And of course, the other assumption is that uh, the global economy will remain fairly favorable. Middle of the road assumption is 0.6% uh, this year. And worst case, 0.3%, which is pretty much in line with what the, with what the Reserve Bank presented, maybe to shock the government into action. Even the best case scenario is not exciting, taking into account where we're coming from. So a lot need to be done to get growth going. If I may add, you know, I like this Chinese form proverb that there's opportunity in crisis. And uh, the electricity crisis is significant, massive, for change in South Africa. <coughs> Government is shrinking right now. We're in the energy sector. Even policy is moving in the right direction. A couple of years ago, remember, the private sector was not permitted, licensed to generate its own electricity. Then there was that one megawatt uh, licensing threshold, and the mining sector was crying for that to be pumped up to just 10. 
COVID shocked the government and OSCOM, of course, uh, with intense load shedding. Bread was raised to a hundred megawatts. <coughs> and then in July last year, when we were shocked by stage six load shedding, basically, government announced the lifting of that threshold. So the private sector can invest as much as it wants to and needs to in embedded generation. The incentives provide, uh, pre uh, presented yesterday, the tax incentives for the corporate sector, any project, renewable energy project for March uh, this year, can the tax deductions can equal 125% of the cost of the project in the first year. So basically, in the, uh, I can't remember, is it for the entire project uh, <coughs> or the job what was what spent in the first year? And uh, then the uh, claim can be 125%. So basically, National Treasury or SAS will give companies money, right? Will lend them free money to invest in renewables. And that is going to be a game changer. Andre, may I yeah. respond? I love these interactions because Isaac and myself, we argue all the time. I think <laughs> one point is, <laughs> um, I think the budget was better than neutral for ratings. I think ratings in South Africa has already bottomed because of the significant reduction in fiscal risk that we've seen over the last few years. I actually think that, um, yeah, it's going to take a long time to get upgraded or get back into investing grade. But in terms of this year, I think Moody's and Fitch will want to wait till later this year, probably after the MTBPS, but then they can lift their outlook statements from stable to positive and match that of S&P. So I think they will want to see how the economy responds, how low chilling goes, etc., wage negotiations, etc. So um, the other point is what Isaac mentioned, and I fully agree. I think that energy reform is perhaps except for the transition to a, a democratic society, the biggest ever reform in South Africa. So that is huge, and that will play a big role. Two years from now, three years from now, the risk of budget will be significantly less than what it is now. It won't be zero, but significantly less. So that is a big part, of, a better part for the SA economy. Mm -hmm. Leon, your thoughts on the energy story? So I think this is a, there's light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. Um, excuse the pun. Um, I think it's uh, load shedding has forced uh, us to move quicker into renewables and as Isaac pointed out the 125% um, deduction is definitely a game changer for businesses. My question is again for households uh, and individuals. Um, the tax break probably won't be enough for those who can afford it and most can't afford it. Um, but it's a definitely a step in the right direction. Coupled with the carbon tax rate that will be ramped up over time, um, you are mentioned that economics is a study of change in human behavior, and carbon tax was designed as the, to do that. So it's always this balance between the carrot and the stick approach. Uh, do you increase taxes and penalize someone, hit them with a stick, or do you increase incentives like Treasury has done just now? And I think the incentive approach will change behavior a lot quicker and, and move us into this just energy transition. Let's perhaps move slightly parallel to these thoughts, uh, the P word, privatization of state-owned assets. Uh, ideologically, perhaps problematic, uh, financially, economically, worthwhile considering, or are they just lost all in some of these issues? Absolutely. Um, privatization, that could be a game changer. <coughs> it's not about getting money, nobody's going to pay for these assets. It's getting the private sector to run these functions far more efficiently. Privatization, that P word is probably never going to happen with an ANC gun. But, I've accepted that, privatization by stealth is happening rapid. Um, private sector involvement in energy, transit, farming out its, its railways. Uh, so it's happening and it's happening fast. And that is also a game changer for us. If that's a P word, then of course, up to the N word, which stands for nationalization. Um, what, what do you think, Isaac? Privatization will never happen? the current government? Well, my sentiment basically is that we're seeing privatization in non-legislative form, if I may put it that way. The liberalization of sectors, you know, uh, 
a lesser role for the state uh, through all its institutions. That's, uh, that's what we need. I mean, that's the model of economic development now, the, the days of big government uh, in very diverse economies and diverse cultures, by the way. Uh, the days of a government being dominant, uh, I believe, are, are over. Uh, so I don't believe that we're going to be moving to, towards end. I think that you know, we're accelerating ahead towards the peak. I think at this stage, let's take one or two questions from our respective audiences. Uh, so we can perhaps take two questions from those seated here and uh, we do have a, a roving mic. I'm not sure whether one of you can take this. So first come, first serve. Which hand's going to go first? Not all at the same time, please. I have a question about the, uh, the, these credits or this, this tax, tax incentives for investment. Is this Gonna, good news is going to help us with, uh, with load shedding in, 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 a few, in a few years. But is, is it also the uh, sort of nascent signs of a just transition or an ecological transition in the, in the South African context? Is, you know, is that one of the side effects of this, uh, this, uh, this policy? Yeah, maybe you'd like to say that one. Yeah, Mark, I, th I think you are right. I'm um, cautiously optimistic um, that this, this is the beginning of more. Um, investment and partnering with private industry. I like what, how you phrase it, stealth privatization. Um, we are forced to, you know, as individuals and as, as corporates to, you know, make things happen um, and, and help out where we can. So I think, yes, this is the, the beginning of, of the just energy transition um, and, I, and I'm hopeful that we will see a greater rollout of, of similar incentives. I think this is the first time um, that individuals are allowed to claim a, a, a private expense other than medical expenses. Um, as I mentioned before, you can't claim for your burglar bars or security alarms, you can't claim for your generator. So this is uh, heralds an important change in, in our tax system. Um, Are the responses to the same I, I just want to add an interesting snippet, not related to the question specifically, but this private sector involvement in energy generation. Um, I calculated the other day all the generator imports since the third quarter of 2021 to now. The capacity of that is 2.2 gigawatt. And that's not counting rooftop solar and other just generators. So but finding the diesel for that? No, of course. I mean, is diesel just? And those are the yeah, questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there any comment to that question or your question? No, I mean, I feel so outmatched by everybody here on my right side, so I don't think I can say anything that has not been said already. If I have a hundred thousand rand, you can say Question what you want. Very well in the interviews for the budget competition, we were very impressed, so I've done it. I can I'm assure sure you, if I was in your, seat, in your batch a uh, number of years ago, I would be trying to hide in a corner. So, well done, well done. <laughs> I can respond to the same question. Yeah, I, I will say yes, the, the developments are encouraging, but it's still early days. Uh, as a country, we've got a lot to do uh, um, to really uh, accelerate the just energy transition in, in the country. We know that uh, financing is a challenge, you know, it's a big issue globally. Our developing economies are going to fund the transition, but we we face serious challenges. Let's take the example of the VW plant in Utina in the Eastern Cape. It produces about 160,000 polos a year. More than half of them go to the European Union markets. From 2035, the EU is going to ban the sale of internal combustion engine cars. And it simply means the VW plant in Newton H is going to have, it's going to sit with a very serious problem by 2035 if it does not shift towards EVs. And as a country, how are we going to facilitate that? Because that is, could be a loss of jobs, not only for the plant, Think of the component manufacturers, the whole supply chain. So I'm just using this one because that's the challenge that we face. Even, you know, we 
often listen to activists of the core lobby uh, arguing that yes, uh, the industrialized economies, uh, you know, became developed on the back of the exploitation of uh, mineral resources such as coal. But the world is shifting. If we don't shift with the world, we're going to have serious problem. For instance, carbon taxes are going to be quite high. So South African goods could face very high taxes in the global market in future if we do not make the production processes cleaner. That's the big challenge. Thank you. Meanwhile, let's take another question from our live audience. Oh, let's not. <laughs> Any questions from our live audience? Or any other questions from our online audience? We'll wait for Anthony to type in this question. So either we are being crystal clear or... I'm not done yet. No, I'm, I'm sure I'm ready no, for more. Sure <laughs> so I think let's kind of pull this. Uh, there's a question. Um, could you perhaps just... Pass it on, thank you. And since we're talking about government expenditure and what it entails to have a fully fledged ministry in terms of government, you know, supports structures or a ministerial support structure, whether that is actually not rather a waste of the necessary resources that we need. No, I think I was rather, uh, I'm just rather thinking about that yeah. because as yeah. a, from a public uh, sector finance and public uh, uh, structure perspective, we kind of get worried and our students are really asking about this. So what is then happening to the Ministry of um, Energy as it currently would be in NARSER, which is the regulatory uh, unit? So why is this notion? How did it come about? Is this really a situation that calls for a separate ministry? And I think you can um, bundle that together with the state of disaster. I don't know whether my question has been asked or whether we need to have disaster only in the area of uh, energy or is it could have been widespread, which also has uh, implications on who's responsible for who or to whom and for what. Yeah. Thank you. Can I please have the microphone back? Um, thank you. I'm sure we all agree that is a question we're all asking since the announcement was made about two weeks ago. I don't think we should have expected the finance minister this budget speech to pass any comment on that, or obviously not make any announcement. I think, frankly, uh, when all is said and done, the finance minister, the man of all the purse things, uh, it's, not, it's not up to him to make ideological decisions. So it doesn't quite fit probably with a, a reflection on, on the speech, but you're more than welcome to pass any, any I, opinions I, about the proposed Minister for Electricity. I, I, I think it's going to be a short-term appointment, relatively short-term. But yeah, it is obviously extra cost. I think it's the lesser of the evils uh, in terms of getting some confidence back that they're absolutely doing something. Having said that, they haven't done anything. Um, so, it's always this frustration with the excruciatingly slow processes. Um, yeah, extra cost, don't think it'll be permanent. Um, as I said, I think the risk of load shedding two years down the line is significantly less than now. So, in the bigger scheme of things, I don't think it's too much of a wastage. Of course, we don't want corruption uh, as part of the state of disaster. To me, to me the concern could be the potential of the turf war. 
the Ministry of Public, of Public Enterprise, the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources, ESCOM itself, the Ministry of Electricity, and some people are looking for some hidden agendas in the fact that this new minister will be positioned next door to the president. Uh, some people saying that, that that's another story, the, the super president, yes. realizing that these ministers aren't doing their jobs and mm. all the power sits in the president. Mm. For me, it's not a risk that the several cause are, but mm. what about the next president? Yeah. 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 Uh, Isaac? I have an opinion different to your hands, and of course, <laughs> it's most it's the case most of the time. I believe that this is, should not be a temporary appointment. You know, I don't like the at least the structure of the Department of Minerals, Mineral Resources and Energy. Mineral Resources and Energy. To me, it says we believe that energy generation should be a function of mineral resources. They should be separated. The title of this new minister should be maybe Minister of Energy and the Just Energy Transition, because there's got to be that holistic approach. Right? Don't only sort out ESCOM because it's a crisis measure. Also focus on the transition to cleaner forms for energy generation. We have a huge conflict when it comes to you know, energy generation and the jet because they sitting under the same minister and uh, you know at the risk of uh, sounding controversial we know his background he was a mining unionist and back then coal miners were big in south africa and while well, they still are to some extent but you know that con connection so i personally does not the bank's view I personally believe that separate energy generation and the transition to clean up forest from mineral resources. I don't think that's necessary to disagree with uh, the honest is a different angle. And if memory serves, that used to be the case. The, the Minister of Minerals was not the same person as the Minister of Energy. But then maybe I'm going back to the previous time. I'm more concerned with the next head of ESCO. Yeah. What happened yeah. yesterday with yeah. you, Andre Gulaito? Yeah, well, he's, he's resigned, he's gone. Yeah, but sooner than expected. Yes, no, I know. And some people are saying because he'll be coming next week. Short story. Great story. Are we back on? Do we have that question? Okay, uh, would you read it out to us, please? So, Anthony says, thank you for the opportunity. The problem is that this is just a band-aid budget patching up the holes. It will not turn on the lights. It will not promote growth and create jobs. The question is what must be done to put SA on a growth and employment curve? Thank you, Anthony. Okay. Um, I think that's a very interesting question. The next question is, is it up to the finance minister to create jobs and do all these things? Uh, at best, I suppose, he can just identify priorities and hopefully they will be the right ones which could create a pathway for future growth. But nonetheless, Johan, would you like to respond to that? I would love to. Um, I, I actually think that the way that budget has been set up in reducing fiscal risk further, that is a huge part of getting confidence, investor confidence back into South Africa. And that's a huge part of this overall process. I agree with you, this doesn't necessarily the nitty gritty about job creation or immediate growth. But if I may, um, I think people tend to, and I've got a huge up here with just focusing on the negatives. And I know there's lots of negatives and I'm not discounting them, but there are also lots of positives. Five, six years ago, we could have rightly argued we were on our way to a failed state status. That's not the case anymore. With this energy reform, in July 2001 with the unrest and in November 2001 when the ANC did pretty bad in local government elections. Everybody expected government to shift policy from the centre to the left, more populist. They didn't. But they also didn't stay put. They shifted policy to the right. And that's significant. 
this invitation to the private sector to come and participate in the economy. So all the policy changes we've seen over the last few years, yes, excruciatingly slowing, being implemented, etc., but they've been happening. So when I see foreign investors, they say to me, why are you South Africans so negative? Well, it's because we're so close to the negative stuff. But they see opportunities. Uh, the fact that not even a President Zuma, when he was in power, tried to fire NPC members at the Central Bank to engineer rate cuts, which is what the Turkish President did last year. So we, South Africa is standing out, and in these changes that has been happening adds into that budget, the fiscal uh, risk that has been reduced. So it's a bunch of things together. I firmly believe medium term growth will be far better than the 1% average we've had until 2019. So better growth going forward. Not spectacularly so. Around 2, 2.5% versus 1. We need 4, 5, 6, I know, but it's all the negatives that's holding us back from that 4, 5, 6, but at least an uplift from the 1. And that will start to make something roads into issues like social unrest, in employment, in confidence in the economy, and confidence will build future growth again. I agree with the sentiments, Johan. I mean, as, you, as you know, I think we read from the same playbook. Um, and I think sometimes we're guilty of just seeing the, the trees and not the bigger picture of the wood. However, Isaac, I, uh, is there a however now? <laughs> is there a but? <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly. National Treasury, as I said, has always been pragmatic in policy making. The other government partners have got to play their role in formulating prudent policy and implementing it. This budget, <coughs> you know, let me start by saying that often in South Africa we are crisis focused. I mean, it's been in electricity right now, right? There have been issues in the past. And we shouldn't only focus on the energy crisis. Let's focus on other sectors, get them to grow, implement those policies, take the better medicine right now. Because once the electricity crisis is over, has been handled and is out of the way, we're going to realize that, oh, actually we've lost ground vis-a-vis -vis the other developing economies. So yes, uh, you know, not enough being done to promote investment, uh, but uh, I wouldn't blame the National Treasury. Thank you so much. It is time for us to start wrapping up. I want to give each one of you a final quick say, and I want you to imagine that you're about to get into an elevator, into a lift, and you bump into somebody who asks you, and you're about to be it's only one point for up, not much time. What's the one thing you say about the budget? Good, bad, and different. I'll start simply from my extreme right, you want? Good budget. We're moving in the right direction. Thank you. Leanne? Okay, I'll take two floors. Interesting proposal. Uh, work from home has garnered attention from Treasury, and they are going to research and probably introduce some proposals uh, for tax deductions for individuals working from home. So, working from home is here to stay. So you don't need this lift? No, I don't need the lift. I see. Yeah, I will say, you know, a couple of friends, a, a friend of mine a couple of years ago said to me that he met a guy in the chain, you know, who said to, to him, the moment the economists say that a budget is good, you must know it's really bad. <laughs> 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 from their perspective, but it, it was an excellent budget, I will say. Okay. You want to add something, Christian? You're welcome. Um, better than expected, I think full of welcome changes. Yeah. <coughs> I think it's a very appropriate way of ending off this fascinating discussion. So it leads me to, first of all, thank each of our panelists. Uh, I really cannot stress how grateful we are. I know that you're all tied up in so many interviews. I think you're unpacked. You've got one. I have to run it off. Thanks for lending me a So do I, actually. <laughs> also. Um, and I'm sure you owe, you, you're probably getting sick and tired of these things. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for, for your time. Thank you, Christian, for joining us. And thank you again to Old Mutual and Netbank for being co hosts of this, of this event. Just to remind you that uh, I think the competition for the next year is opening up pretty soon. It it's up there already. It's yes. already. <laughs> and if I may be so presumptuous, both of you, could we invite some of our students to enter? 
Of course. Okay. Absolutely. Well, we'll studying economics. We'll extend that invitation to that. Leanne, thank you for your precious time. Thank you to the audience for being here, both here and I'm not sure whether we're still online. Yeah. Okay, thanks to all of you. And someone's asking whether this is being recorded and if so, can people gain access? YouTube tomorrow. Okay, so Dirk, I hope you heard that. Yes, it is being recorded. It will be available, I gather, from tomorrow on YouTube. Um, and I don't think we should uh, go beyond this. I've looked at all the important things. Once again, thank you so much to all of you. And uh, I, if I may just add in conclusion, I do welcome the, the generally upbeat interpretations. I think you're quite right, Juan, you're all right. We tend to zoom in on the now and the immediate, which can be doomy and gloomy. But it's important to st stand back a little bit and recognize uh, the small, even big trials. And I think this is one of them. Along Treasury, along with SARS, along with the Reserve Bank, are standing tall and proud amidst the erosion here and there of institutional integrity. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.